Welcome to the Counter Narrative Podcast, a show designed to change the way we talk and think about education. By sharing stories of successes and triumphs, we aim to challenge the dominant narrative that often negatively portrays our disenfranchised populations. I'm your host, Charles Williams, an educator for 15 years, a current school principal in Chicago, and an educational consultant. Let's get started. This episode is a pause to ponder segment. These bi-weekly sessions will allow me to share with you my personal thoughts and reflections on a wide spectrum of topics as they relate to education. It is my hope that you will be able to take something from these segments and apply it in a meaningful way as you continue to do amazing work. Remember, while we all have different roles, we all have a single job, educating our students. I find it interesting how events or moments in our lives seem to converge at the exact point where we are able to clearly navigate the threads that connect these once seemingly unassociated elements. Points of clarity that give life to insights that had been previously flitting around in our subconsciousness. I have shared with you, or at least I think I have, that I've been reading Dr. King's text, Why We Can't Wait. It is nearly impossible for me to ignore that the sentiments he expresses in these pages can easily be shared and understood today, despite originating in 1963, nearly 60 years ago. Consider when he discusses the overwhelming use of peaceful protests. He acknowledged that there were those who preferred to take a more violent approach, but that those were often extremists, or those who were sent to undermine and deter from the primary mission. Compare this then with an article released on September 5th of this year by Time Magazine, sharing that more than 93% of the more than 7,750 Black Lives Matters protests across this entire country have been peaceful. Despite this, we were consistently bombarded with images of the damage and the destruction that was left in the wake of rioters. As I have said before, I do not condone rioting or even looting, and it is unfortunate that some resorted to these violent tactics. However, it is also disappointing to know that the same methods of depicting movements intended to foster change and and break systems of oppression as a mere catalyst for social unrest and vandalism. In another text I'm reading with my staff, Dr. Howard's Why Race and Culture Matter, He points out that schools were used during the early 1900s eugenics movement to justify controversial claims that black and brown students were mentally inferior to their white peers. A common tool that was used to measure cognitive ability was the Army Alpha and Beta examinations, two assessments that were based more on familiarity with American culture than on innate intelligence. You know, I I couldn't help but to reflect on a CPS policy adopted in 1991 that allowed for culturally responsive standardized testing. Despite this document being nearly 30 years old, few of the educational leaders that I was working with knew that this policy even existed, and we definitely didn't see any evidence of such assessments. Instead, we, and not just CPS, continue to use widely available standardized tests for students, regardless of their backgrounds. In fact, the SAT, which is quickly becoming more of an option than a requirement, was scrutinized by researcher Jay Rosner, who analyzed 276 verbal and math questions in the experimental section of the test between 1998 and 2000. You know, that, that part where they pitch potential questions for future tests but because they want to see how students perform before they make a decision. Well, Rosner discovered what he deemed black questions, which were those questions where more black students answered correctly than white students. Those questions, well, they never made it into future versions of the test. 
Additionally, Roy Friedel, who is a psychometrician and former employee of the Educational Testing Service, found that black students on average did better than white students on those questions that were more difficult. Because these questions were not as common and had much more complex levels of difficulty, he attempted to convince test administrators to weigh these questions more heavily, but they refused. The final piece came to me in the form of Rennie Edo Lodge's podcast about race, which if you haven't yet listened to it, please do yourself a favor and add it to your playlist. In episode eight, The Anti-Racist Renaissance, Rennie speaks with Mira Sayal and asks if she is experiencing a severe case of deja vu, to which she replies that she could probably extract passages from a speech that she gave in the 80s that would still hold true today. Sayal continued by saying that we need to be vigilant and continue to monitor the world around us. Because when we stop, when we become complacent, it gets bad all over again. It was at that moment that I felt a rush of my synapses all seemingly firing at once. That the metaphorical light bulb blazed to life with an intensity that would have blinded the drivers around me. So let's thank goodness that it's it's only a metaphor, right? Why do we keep having the same conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why do we keep trying to address the same systems of oppression that have impacted black and brown people in this country? Why do we keep listening to politicians who attempt to placate and pacify us in public while signing into law mandates that continue to strip us of our freedoms? Why do we keep experiencing this sense of deja vu? I, I, I mean... None of this is new. It may feel new. It may look new. But deep down, at its core, it's the same problem. And almost as to validate my response to these rhetorical swarm of questions that suddenly flooded into my thoughts, came the voice of Diane Abbott, who shared that we need to stop waiting for someone else to come in and fix our problem, that that some knights in shining armor would come galloping into the save the day, (laughs) or even uh, to tie in yet another text, that we need to stop waiting for Superman. Abbott continued by clarifying that she's not suggesting that everyone just jump into politics, well, maybe with the exception of practicing your right to vote, but that we all need to do something. What good does it do to listen to a podcast or engage in a conversation or watch a show and then doing nothing more than simply feeling reinforced in your ideas about society? This concept, the idea of moving beyond hashtags or or walking your talk, two beliefs that I share widely, it's not new for me. I've long been frustrated with the notion that people fall into their expressive comfort zones, places where they can tout their beliefs that push back against the dominant narrative, yet do so in relative safety because they're surrounded by like-minded individuals. I mean, it's great that these conversations are taking place, but it does us no good if they remain within the protective bubbles of nonconformist cliques. Nothing changes. If nothing changes. So I ask you today, what are you doing so that we end this cycle of oppression? How will you emerge from your zones of comfort and and stand side by side in the openness that is vulnerability? How will you speak up and act out so that we no longer need to experience this sense of deja vu? Nothing changes. If nothing changes, until next time. I want to thank you for listening to the Counter Narrative Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, please be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow the show on Twitter at the CN Podcast and the host at underscore CW Consulting. Take care. <laughs>